<clears throat> we're at, uh, returning to the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 9 and the first nine verses. Uh, this, I believe, is the... Uh, I, I, some of us, you know, I think are familiar with maybe one gospel over another, and uh, I seem to, for some reason, like the gospel of Matthew. For some reason, it just seems to be laid out better. It's, for me, it's more understandable. So I always compare everything that I see here with Matthew's gospel. But what we have here is what we see in Matthew chapter 10, where the Lord is uh, basically calling his disciples together, and he's going to send them out uh, to preach, giving them instruction before they go. And interestingly enough, even though Luke's gospel doesn't have as many chapters as Matthew, but it's much longer, actually. These are much fuller chapters. He gives us a much more condensed version of what we have in Matthew chapter 10. But anyway, I believe this is the first time Jesus sends his disciples out to preach on their own without his being with them. Uh, they have been trained, and now he's sending them to do the work that he was sent into the world to do, and he was sent particularly to Israel to do, which is to preach the gospel and to call the lost sheep into the fold. This I want us to see uh, this morning as we basically summarize everything that Jesus was about. This was his heart. He had a heart to gather the lost sheep. So let's, um, let's read these first nine verses and then we'll uh, do a little bit of review of what we saw last week and then we'll see what uh, we can learn from this. Well, Luke writes, And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all the demons and to heal diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to perform healing. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, neither a staff nor a bag nor bread nor money, and do not even have two, um, two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that city. And as for those who do not receive you, as you go out from that city, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Departing, they began going throughout the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was happening, and he was greatly perplexed, because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen again. Herod said, I myself had John beheaded, but who is this man about whom I hear such things? And he kept trying to to see him. Well, may the Lord bless this part of his word to our understanding this morning, and may he also show us particularly how this applies to us and how we might use it uh, to better serve the Lord. Now, again, first of all, by way of review, um, and I'll just say by way of, um, I think, the obvious, uh, as Christians, we certainly believe that God exists, that God is, and we believe that what his word says is true, that he is ready and he is willing to give to us everything that he has promised. But there are certain things we know from the scriptures that need to be true of us before the Lord will give to us what he has promised. And last week we saw some of those things. We were reminded of them from the two accounts. The, first of all, the woman with the hemorrhage. I think a wonderful example of, of faith. First of all, we saw that we need to set all of our hope on the Lord. For his help, the woman understood after so many years of trying to fix the problem on her own by going to the various doctors and spending everything that she had, that Jesus was her only hope. She finally came down to that, so she looked to him, set her sights upon him. Our Lord tells us that that's what we need to do with regard to our needs as well, and that he will give us what we need if we will set all of our hopes on him. Our help does not come from man. Our hope comes from the Lord. Secondly, we need to believe that there's nothing that stands in our way of actually approaching the Lord. Remember how the woman would not come to Jesus directly, but basically was trying to come up behind him in the crowd and un, you know, being, being unnoticed, basically reach out and, and sort of take her miracle and sort of run but, of course, she didn't escape uh, notice. But the Lord, when he realized that power had gone from him and virtue, his virtue had healed her, the Spirit of God had healed her, he didn't reprove her for what she had done, but rather did what she didn't expect. Remember, the woman was unclean, thought that Jesus may treat her as unclean, but he welcomed her 
with open arms because of his love and because he saw the faith that was in her. And she had her miracle because of that faith. We need to re remember ourselves that Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins so that we might come to him and be welcomed by him and received by him and we don't have to be afraid that he will receive us. Uh, we saw thirdly that we must not doubt that he will give to us what we have asked. She knew that if she just reached out and touched the hem of his robe, she would be healed. If we believe that not only that he is able but also willing, uh, we will have what we ask. We just need to make sure that we don't doubt. You know, when we doubt, we're basically doubting the, the truthfulness, the veracity, the the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're also reminded uh, from the second account of Jairus that sometimes our faith isn't strong enough. Sometimes what we have to face is so overwhelming that things can seem hopeless, such as it did for Jairus, remember, when he was told that his daughter had died and the people were telling him who had come out to tell him, why bother Jesus anymore? There's really nothing that he can do about it. So Jairus descended into basically that uh, hopelessness, but Jesus turned to him quickly and encouraged him and told him not to be afraid that his daughter would live. Just believe. You know, we need to know that Jesus can help us. We need to know that Jesus will help us and not to be afraid, but rather to believe and to know that Jesus is going to encourage us even as he did Jairus. The Lord may sometimes test us to our limit, but he's never going to make us go through what we go through alone. The Lord is going to be with us in, in everything. Now, I think this is important to understand as we come to our topic this morning because it's the most daunting thing, perhaps, the Lord calls us to do. I think perhaps the two most difficult things the Lord calls us to do as Christians is to love our enemies and to evangelize the lost, right? And really, oftentimes, that may be the same thing. Uh, it's difficult, but we need to realize that the Lord is going to be with us in this. He doesn't call us to do it on our own. As a matter of fact, Jesus has already given to us the desire to do this, which is what we need most of all. Now, what we want to see this morning is the heart that our Lord Jesus Christ has for the lost. Now, we could actually draw that conclusion from just about any text in Scripture because he's always out there preaching, he's always out there healing and, and serving the lost, in order to bring them to faith in himself. But here we see that he commissions the 12 and sends them out specifically to do that. Now, having returned from Jairus' house, we believe he's still in basically in Galilee, in that um, area where Capernaum is, uh, where he raised, of course, uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead. Jesus is now calling the 12 together and commissioning them to go out and preach the gospel in order that they might raise the dead. And I think uh, in this case, spiritually, although they did it literally as well, physically, but to preach the gospel in order that those who were dead might hear the voice of Jesus and might be raised from the dead. Now, as I've said, this is applicable to us today because we need to realize that this same work has been entrusted to us so as we go through this and see what Jesus is saying to his disciples, we need to consider how what he says here can also help us do what he's called us to do. Now, the first thing we see here is that Jesus has called us uh, to serve him in this work. And the reason why he's done that is because he has an interest in seeing the lost come to faith in Christ. He wants us to be those who are seeking and searching for the lost. Now, when he called his disciples originally, okay, and specifically here, it was that they might evangelize, that they might, you know, preach the gospel to the lost, and when they come to faith, disciple them in order that they might also go and evangelize others. And they were to do this not just when they were with Jesus, but particularly after Jesus left to go into heaven. So this was why he was training them. This is what he was training them to do, to be fishers of men, to go and to make disciples. We know that Jesus would eventually send them out to the nations. It's the last thing Jesus did before he ascended into heaven was give them the Great Commission. But of course, they were to begin in Palestine. 
That was what Jesus was doing. I, I was sent to no one but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, we do understand that the disciples' calling was a bit different than ours, I think significantly different. Their ministry was foundational to the New Testament church, uh, not only with regard to their evangelism, you know, breaking ground and laying the foundation with regard to the initial or the first fruits of those who would come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but also with regard to organizing the church and completing the New Testament. That's something that we don't do, okay? That was, that was unique to them. But our calling was, is still similar to theirs because like them, Jesus has called us also to serve. He has called us to be his representatives to this world. Uh, you've heard this over and over again. I think it's a wonderful statement that Luther made. Jesus calls us to be Christ to the world. We are to represent him to others. We are to be his hands. We are to be his feet. We are to reflect his character, show his love. We are to serve as Jesus served. This is shining the light so that others may see and glorify the Father who is in heaven. This is what Jesus has called us to do in the Great Commission. We are to share with others what Jesus Christ has done with those who are around us, those who are near, before we would go far. Uh, I think you know, we're still pretty busy with those who are near. Our family, our friends, our neighbors, people that we work with, uh, the Lord has called us to be his ambassadors, to be his representatives, to represent Jesus to others. So that is how we are similar to the disciples, aside from the fact that we also are inheritors of the kingdom, that we are working now, but one day we're going to be able to rest from our labors with an eternal rest. So while we have strength and opportunity, this is what we are to be about. Now, secondly, he's given us the power to do this. And again, he gave us the power because he has a heart for the lost. He wants the lost to be saved. After Jesus called the 12 to himself, he gave them power. He gave them authority over demons, over disease. And this was to prove that God was with them and make their audience pay attention. You know, when you raise somebody from the dead, that stops traffic. People pay attention. Um, and when you heal somebody that has, you know, visible disease, that basically does the same thing, or you cast the demon out of a demoniac. Now, he also empowered them to preach the gospel. Now, he's not specifically mentioned here, but I think we should understand that Jesus was giving them the Holy Spirit, empowering them with the Spirit to carry out this work, because you can't do this work without the Spirit, right? You can't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ without the Spirit, but yet the disciples already loved him. They already trusted him. They were already following him, even knowing what it was going to cost them eventually in bringing this gospel to others. Did they do that in their own strength? No, the Spirit of God was working through them. So they had the Spirit of God, but now Jesus is giving them the Spirit in a more powerful way to carry out this work, giving them authority over Again, the forces of darkness against disease and power to preach the gospel. Now, Jesus has given to us the Spirit of God, hasn't he? And he's given him to us in a saving way. I mean, he's given us then basically this same heart and the same desire that Jesus has to reach out to the lost. The reason why we have it is because we have the Spirit of God in us. That is true if we are loving him, trusting him and following him this morning. And we understand that post-Pentecost, the Lord has also made available to us an even greater power than the disciples may have been, you know, uh, had access to in their days, although it's kind of hard to realize how that could be. But we have seen the Lord work very powerfully even since the days of the apostles. But we have access to this kind of power. Now, what is this power really? Well, it's the work of the Holy Spirit but I think what it is, is not giving to us any new faculties or any new abilities, but rather it's giving to us more of what he's already given to us when he saved us, and that is more love, a greater love that produces a greater zeal and that produces also a greater courage. Remember what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given to us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. 
Now, sometimes you might think that there's a distinction between these things. Um, how do you overcome fear? Well, you overcome it with love, don't you? Uh, love helps you to break through those barriers and to love the, one, the object of your love. Uh, where do you get this power to, to be the witnesses of the gospel? Well, love is what will cause you to break through everything that is inhibiting you to actually reach out. Where do you get discipline? Well, it comes from loving the Lord enough to basically discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So what he gave to his disciples was really an injection or infusion of more of the Holy Spirit's work, more of this love, and that's also what he has given to us and what he makes available to us. Now, I'm not saying by this that we have the disciples' authority over the demons or over sickness, but we do have the Spirit's fire in our souls to empower us to be his witnesses in this world, to shine his light. We have that. Of course, we need to nurture it. We need to strengthen it. We need to make sure we don't quench it and grieve the Spirit of God. Okay? That's very important. If, if we are not putting the Lord first, then we're not going to experience this power. Now, next, Jesus has given to us the command to go. Because, again, he has a heart for the lost. He wants to use us to reach the lost. Now, having trained the disciples, remember Jesus didn't just call them from their, fisher, their, you know, their fishermen's tasks and their nets and throw them straight into the field. He, did, he was training them for some period of time. But having now trained them and having now given them this power and this authority, he gives them the command to go. And we need to understand that this really is the, the goal. Okay, this is the end. The means is discipleship, and that's what Jesus was doing with his disciples, discipling them. But the end, the goal, is evangelism itself. Discipleship is like being in school. You know, we go to school to train for a particular vocation and so forth. Evangelism is doing the work that we've been schooled for. And just as we don't stay essentially in school our entire lives preparing for a work that we're never actually going to get down to doing, the Lord doesn't want us forever to, to train in Jesus' school of discipleship and never get down to evangelism. You know, he wants us to get down to the work that he's actually called us to do. And again, this speaks to all of us. This is perhaps the most neglected thing in, in the church is evangelism. But this is really what the Lord wants us to be doing. Jesus has given us the command, go and make disciples. Now, I think we need to be encouraged here because even though it is the most difficult thing that the Lord calls us to do, perhaps on par with loving our enemies, it is also by far the most rewarding thing that the Lord has called us to do. I think of everything he's called us to do. And I don't think we often realize this. Now, not just in heaven, not just storing up treasures in heaven. I'm talking about rewards now on earth. Now, remember when the disciples came to Jesus on that one occasion with food at the well of Samaria, and Jesus said, I have food to eat that you don't know of. And then they looked around, they said, has somebody brought food to Jesus before we got to him? Well, Jesus wasn't talking about physical food. He was talking about another kind of food that he had to eat that has been called in the history of the church hidden Manna, it is heavenly bread and it's hidden because you really can't see it with your eyes. It's more of a spiritual food that the Spirit of God gives and it is a food that fully satisfies. Remember what Jesus said on that occasion? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus said, that's more satisfying to me than the food that you've brought me to eat. And you know, it actually is. And the Lord, I think, feeds us with this food much more abundantly, if we can put it in those terms, when we do this particular work, because this is the one that is nearest to his heart. And this food does satisfy, satisfies the souls almost like nothing else, because it is a communication of the Holy Spirit. And he's the only one who can really satisfy our souls. This is how Jesus feeds us. Now, fourthly, we also see in our text that if Jesus calls us to do this full time, he says that we should be supported by those we serve. And the reason is because he doesn't want 
those who are doing this work to be encumbered by trying to earn a living while they're trying to do this. And the reason is so they can devote themselves to doing this. And Jesus wants them to do this because he has a heart for the lost. He wants to see them saved. Now, he told his disciples to take nothing with them except the clothes on their back. When they entered into a house, they were to stay there. When somebody offered them hospitality, stay until they left that city. He wanted them to be sustained by those they served. Now, we might look at that and say, well, that's unusual. I mean, why would Jesus call them to do that? But we need to understand that this is essentially what they were doing all the time. This wasn't anything new, right? Because this is how they were already being supported by those that they were serving, right? Did Jesus have a job that was, he was doing on the side or the disciples? Do we see them going to their work and then, then basically you know, evangelizing part-time? No, they were doing this full-time. And for the most part, their needs were being provided by those who were following them. Luke already told us about the women who followed Jesus and were supporting him and his followers from their personal means. That was actually the last chapter we were looking at. So if this is what Jesus has called us to do full time, this is how he intends for us to be supported. Paul says exactly the same thing in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 through 14. He says, do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. He wants them to be supported so they can do this work. Now, if that's what he hasn't called us to do full time, then the Lord tells us we are to support those who actually are doing it full time. Uh, Paul writes in Galatians 6, 6, the one who is taught the word is to share all good things with the one who teaches him. Uh, basically provide for their needs. So this is how the Lord has ordained that we be provided for or that his work be sustained. Now, fifthly, if we share the gospel with someone and they don't listen to us, we are to move on to someone else, okay? And again, the reason is because Jesus wants the lost to be reached and he doesn't want us to waste time with people who aren't going to listen to us. Now, Jesus told his disciples that if there was a particular city or some within the city that did not receive them, that did not receive their message, that they're to leave, go somewhere else, right? And as they're leaving, they are to shake the dust off their feet as a testimony against them. Jesus is essentially telling them not to waste their time trying to convince those who refuse to listen. Now, I, we would say, you know, don't just say it once and, you know, if you don't get a good reception, move. But I think he's talking about, you know, well, in this case, he might have meant that because there were a lot of villages they had to get through. But as far as we're concerned, I think we do need to use a reasonable amount of effort. But if they're resistant, then there's a point at which you have to say, as Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 6, no longer casting our pearl before swine. If they're, if they're just going to basically... Uh, degradate the gospel and then turn and attack us, we need to, to move on to somebody else who might hear. There are so many people who need to hear. And there are so few people that actually understand the gospel. So we need to move on to somebody who might listen to us. They needed to move on. And as they left, they were to shake the dust off of their feet as a testimony against them. And I think it was meant to be a warning. You know, basically, it's elaborated on in another one of the gospels uh, as, you know, basically as we wipe this dust off our feet, even, even the dust of your city that clings to us, we're going to wipe off in testimony against you. And I think what they were saying was essentially this. This is what the Lord is going to do to you on the day of judgment if you don't repent. He's going to wipe you off the soles of his feet. And, of course, he's going to wipe them off into perdition. So it's a warning, leaving them with a warning. It's, you know, everything is not okay if you've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus wants us to share the gospel with as many people as we can. When we run into those who are argumentative, he wants us to move on to someone else who will listen. But we shouldn't move on until we at least warn them of the danger that they're in for not listening and not receiving Jesus. Now, finally, 
we need to believe that as we go, Jesus is going to be with us to bless this work. And the reason is because he wants it to succeed, doesn't he? Jesus has a heart for the lost. Now, we read that the disciples obeyed Jesus. Luke writes in verse 6, departing, they began going throughout the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. I'm sure as they did, they were blessed for what they were doing. And they might have also uh, had some persecution. But the result was, the word about Jesus began to spread everywhere. And people were hearing about it everywhere. And it reached the ears of the ruler of that particular area, the ruler of Galilee, and that would be Herod, okay? Herod Antipas. By the way, Herod, Herod is, is not a name. Herod, Herod is a title, right? And so there's a lot of people called Herod. So which, which one was this? Well, this Herod was the son of Herod the Great, okay? Herod the Great is the one who was the king over that area. When Jesus was born, he was the one who sent his soldiers to kill Jesus, you know, when he found he was tricked by the wise men and so forth. Well, this Herod, Antipas, is the son of Herod the Great. And he was the one who was the ruler of Galilee all during the time of Jesus' ministry. And he was also the one who had put John the Baptist to death. Okay, so this is that Herod. And when Herod heard what he heard about Jesus, he was confused. Some were saying that Elijah uh, or one of the prophets had, had basically was ministering. And so he wasn't quite sure. But the thing I think he was most concerned about was this, that some were saying that this Jesus was actually John the Baptist who had risen from the dead, the one that he had beheaded. So Herod was very interested in what was going on here. Is this John? Is this someone else? And Herod wanted to see Herod actually wanted to see Jesus perform a miracle, but we're going to uh, see later in Luke's gospel. That's not why Jesus does miracles. He doesn't do it in order to entertain people. Herod will, will n actually not be able to see Jesus until Pilate sends him to him just before he is sentenced and crucified. When Jesus doesn't perform, he sends him back to Pilate. Luke is the only one who tells us about that encounter, but that encounter with Herod is the same Herod that Luke is telling us about now. But the point here I want us to see is this. As the disciples were faithful to obey Jesus, um, our Lord was faithful to use their efforts to bring his lost sheep home. Uh, what they were doing was very effective. People were talking about it and word was spreading. And it, it, as I said before, it reached Herod. Not everybody was converted by it. You know, no one is, I mean, it's not going to be a case that everyone, it's never going to be the case that everyone gets converted, but there will be those who will be converted. And that's what we're after, right? The lost sheep that we're seeking to gather. As we set out to do the work that our Lord Jesus Christ has called us to do, he is going to be working with us as well. He said to his disciples in the Great Commission, which also applies to us, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus has an interest in the success of this particular mission. Do you think he's not going to help us obtain the end or to do what it is he calls us to do? So what we need is what we saw at the beginning. We need faith. We need to believe that all these things are true. Jesus has saved us and he has sent us and he will be with us. And if we have that kind of faith then we need to put our hand to the plow and we need to trust that the Lord will work with us even as he worked with them to bring about his purposes. Now, this morning we're worshiping the Lord. This is a part of what the Lord calls us to do, right? To meet together and to honor him and praise him. This morning we've been discipled, uh, at least a bit, from this particular portion of scripture. We understand what it means, we understand how it applies. But we do need to understand we haven't reached the goal until we actually put this into practice. So we really need to pray that God would give us the grace to do this because this really is the end, okay? This is the goal. This is the reason why Jesus came into the world and saved us. It wasn't just to save us from danger. That was part of it. But it was also to enlist us in his army and to call us to be his ambassadors, his evangelists, his witnesses in the world. Doesn't mean that we necessarily need to go to a foreign land. Maybe, maybe we will, maybe not. It's up to the Lord. But it does mean we need to reach out to the people around us and try to influence them 
with the gospel. One of the reasons why the nation is in the, the condition that it's in is because the church has cloistered itself and we're, we're busy worshiping and discipling, but we never really do what the purpose of this is, is for, and that's to get out. So we need to pray that the church would get out. We need to pray that we would get out and influence the culture for our Lord Jesus as he calls us. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, let's ask the Lord to help us to show us that this really is the case and to encourage us to do this.